Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Market5. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Reverend Father Emmanuel Lemelson of Lemelson Capital Management on the line. How are you doing today, Reverend Father? Glory be to God. Very well. <laughs> Thanks for the invite on the show. Great to have you on the show today as the Pope is making his visits to the United States, uh, different, uh, making his visits around. Uh, what about, you know, his positions on uh, American capitalism and free markets? Sure. That's a great question, Joel. Um, his all holiness, Pope Francis, uh, that really hasn't been the thrust of his message in America, but it's certainly been an issue he's been interested in if you read his encyclicals. And um, he raises a lot of very important points. Um, some of that's been toned down a little bit during this visit, but his position really deals with the economic injustice, which can come forth from a market that's as free as the United States is. Um, but I don't think the financial media has necessarily gotten the message exactly right of what Pope Francis is trying to convey. I don't think for a second um, he means to say that freedom should be stifled in markets, in the public markets for the formation of capital. Uh, and I don't think he would suggest that, because in any philosophy or theology of the human person, uh, which is Christian in its fundamental precepts, you'd have to acknowledge that at the very heart of God's creation is freedom. I mean, it's the first thing that sort of Adam and Eve are imbued with in, in the story of creation in Genesis. And that freedom is intrinsic uh, to every aspect of life, including a modern theory of economic principles. So anytime I think freedom is stifled in public markets, you're taking something away. But freedom, of course, always brings you the risk of, of abuse and um, of things going awry or wrong. So I hope that the American people would understand that His All Holiness of the Message is not so much about stifling freedom in markets or that capitalism is intrinsically bad or evil or something like that. It's clearly not. But that freedom has a price, and all the more reason for there to be prudence and wisdom in markets um, because of the possibility of for the abuse of freedom. Uh, this week, for example, you probably read um, about the story of Barton Shkreli and, and uh, touring pharmaceuticals and the, the radical increases in the price of certain uh, discrete drugs that are used to treat um, certain indications, uh, certain uh, conditions which are very rare, uh, and how this has been a trend in the pharmaceutical industry. Hilly Clinton had commented on it. There, there's a great example where freedom may have gone awry in, in small biotech and really a trend. So um, I think his message is incredibly important. I would suggest anyone interested in the topic uh, read uh, the Pope's encyclicals on the matter. It's very, very enlightening. Uh, moving on to some individual issues here. Last time you were on the show, we talked about uh, Netflix, and uh, you were looking. You were, took a short position in it. Is that something that you've covered on the flash crash, or what's your current outlook on Netflix? <laughs> you know, good call, Joel. Actually, we did cover it on the flash crash. We initially shorted about fifteen and a half. Uh, we covered it in the nineties, and um, and then by chance, you know, it sprung right back up, and we shorted it again at one seventeen uh, and change. I don't know the exact. Uh, uh, dollar figure. It was over 117. So, not not really typical for us to to. You sound to you sound like a day trader there, uh, Reverend Father. You, <laughs> you're flipping. Not exactly a day, but maybe a week trader or something <laughs> like that. Wow. Like not our mo, but you know, nobody saw that flash crash coming. It was pretty intense, and it, it was a very quick. I mean, like a 20 percent profit or something. I, I think we covered it at 95 actually, and then we shorted it again at 117. So and, it worked out well. And uh, what about your Legan Pharmaceuticals? I know you had taken a little bit of heat as that moved up. Did you use the uh, flash crash to exit that as well? Uh, um, the answer is no, Joel. And there's a lot I would say about Legan Pharmaceuticals, but, you know, I'll just hold off for now. Okay. Uh, I love about biotech in general, small biotech, but for okay. the time being, I'll... I'll pass on that question. Okay. All right. We will pass on that then. You were bearish Alibaba last time we were on. Uh, I don't know if you played it from the short side at all, but uh, what's your look? Is it getting down to relative value here or still hands off like Baron says in Alibaba? Well, it's interesting. You know, I mean, our commentary on Alibaba goes back to our, our January interview, I think, uh, on Benzinga, if memory serves me correctly. And, um, you know, it, it's gone down over 40% since then. So I think that interview was January 28th, and that would have been, what, seven or eight months in advance of Barron's. So <laughs> I think the commentary made then about Chinese IPOs, uh, it looks particularly prescient now in hindsight. Um, I think a lot of valid questions have been raised about some of their shipping volumes and, and what you know carriers could possibly deliver versus what Alibaba is reporting. They're, they're reporting numbers that are just hard to wrap your mind around for delivery. So um, 
you know, why speculate there? I mean, if there's any question whatsoever on the validity of the books, um, why get involved? I mean, wait and see. Time, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful saying: time reveals truth and justice. Um, the, the numbers there look very suspicious, so just wait. I mean, maybe maybe they'll Alibaba will prove that they really are this fantastic. I mean, maybe they won't, but you don't have to swing at every ball that you're, you know, it gets pitched at you. So I would say wait on Alibaba. But looking back again, uh, nine months. I mean, it looks awfully prescient. Down over forty percent since we said basically stay away. National Bank of Greece here. Uh, you expressed caution on that issue after uh, after the Greek bailout here. Uh, any outlook here? <laughs> Improving outlook for the National Bank of Greece. Um, well, you know, bank stocks in general are difficult to invest in in any country um, because their balance sheets are it's really hard to understand counterparty risk, especially when they use derivatives and so forth. But how much is that multiplied when you start talking about Greece? And I'll, I'll just put on my sort of Greek hat now for a minute as a person who's half Greek, and I'll be very critical of anything on the Athens stock, stock Exchange. It's a low trust environment, and I would say, um, you know, stay away. Uh, you've got two, two things working against you. You've got a financial issue, and you've got a culture of, frankly, uh, difficult to trust the marketplaces there. So uh, it's not worth it. Uh, you were taking opposite. You were looking a little bit of retail. You were taking opposite ends on uh, shares of uh, Aeropostel and American Eagle here. Uh, kind of both going in your directions. Are those uh, positions you're still holding, or are you out of? Yeah, we yeah we purchased American Eagle um, back in I believe it was Q two two thousand fourteen. We did very well on that issue. It, it's a great company. Um, I think we made about forty percent. It continued to rise after we sold it. Probably should have kept it. It had a very healthy dividend. Looking back, selling it was probably premature. But in that interview when we spoke, I believe that was um, our October 16th, 2014 interview, we also happened to mention that we thought Aeropostal was a company in real trouble. And I think those shares have collapsed about 75% since that interview. So, again, wound up being pressure. But, um, you know, Aeropostal is an interesting situation. I mean, there's there's a, a PE firm involved. They have some very interesting agreements in place with the company, which are not advantageous to the company at all. And I think that the common shareholders... Um, you know, I wouldn't look at that as a value. It's probably a value trap. You walk in those stores, they're they're dead, and they're you know they they really can't even give their merchandise away. So, um, as cheap as it looked at three dollars a share when we talked uh, last October about a year ago, I'm not convinced it's cheap now, uh, and it's trading for you know well under a dollar. So it's about six ten cents a share, I believe. So I would say also just stay away. Um, uh, you know. If a company is in real trouble, no price is too cheap, actually. And if there's real problems with the management team and the structure of the company, so the value you're getting there is totally unclear. Uh, Geo space uh, technologies here. I know you were accumulating it for quite some time. You've got a few pops in it, but now, uh, now back at the bottom of its trading range here, are you still uh, are you still active or still looking for a rise in this stock? Yeah, great question, Joel. You know, we own about five percent of the company. Uh, we're still our our plan is to still continue to to acquire the company. Actually, uh, we probably don't look very smart at the moment, given the the continued depressed price. But for us, that's actually exactly what we want because we're still buyers. And uh, Geospace is a special situation. It's it's different than like a misunderstood company. It's a company that's losing money. They're losing about two million dollars a quarter because um, their their assets are radically underutilized. Um, but we believe that those assets will be productive again. And we think that the greatest value can be found in companies that produce a tangible product that has real significant utility for honest management in place and that there's an industry-wide problem. This is not a company-specific problem. So, uh, you know, we're, our thesis is pretty simple. It's that seismic data has a critical or cardinal role to play in the future of stable energy markets. We don't think oil will be cheap forever. And we think that given the world's population growth over the next 20 years, um, <clears throat> fossil fuels and uh, car, uh, hydrocarbons will play an important role in energy needs, regardless of the growth in alternative fuel sources. So that's not really a radical hypothesis, but we're, you know, buying geospace today for us is really buying distressed assets that are probably already uh, over, overly depleted on balance sheet. But we're really paying like 50 cents on the dollar, and uh, we, we think the company's done a very judicious job of uh, impairing their assets according to GAAP, but we think they've done actually too good of a job, so we think inventory's undervalued, and the value of a lot of their assets, their real estate. All right, and, let's get to, uh, get to one of your other bearish plays here, and I know this one has uh, been giving you a little bit of hard time here. Skechers, uh, good numbers out of Nike here. Uh, did have a yeah. nice drop on the flash cash, came right back up. Uh, how, what's your take on Skechers? 
Yeah, we still think it's radically overpriced. I think it's sad, frankly, and, and we keep shorting it. I mean, we did increase our short, uh, our average short price now is around 132. So, you know, we're still losing something uh, on that position. I mean, we're down 8% or something, but we're going to keep shorting it. And as we said in the past, uh, we, we were long sketchers that are, you know, just under $12 a share in late 2011. And people said, that's crazy. Um, well, uh, you know, the stock went up after that, you know, obviously like tenfold plus. Um, I think for the, co- the company hasn't changed that much in the nature of what it is. It's really it's a marketing company. They've got real serious legal problems. Uh, they, they've got just tons of lawsuits. They're, they're, they're a marketing machine, but they're not producing a better mousetrap. And they have no real R&D budget, unlike Nike. And I don't think it's sustainable. They're good at catching on to, to, to fads and following maybe the thought leaders in the industry. And they have some nice-looking shoes. But everyone I talk to, their feet hurt when they wear those things. <laughs> okay. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, I, I don't wear them. to begin with is really difficult. Yeah. Okay. I, have, I, haven't, I haven't tried a pair of those on yet. Uh, <laughs> you're, uh, you're not missing much, Joel. They look good, but I don't know about the, the value to your feet. Uh, still wearing the sandals because it's still pretty hot out here. Uh, just uh, we got about another minute here just real quickly. Uh, Apple Bull, you, your price target's considerably oh, yeah. higher than this. Uh, still maintaining your bullish thesis on Apple? Yeah, you know, I, I would even raise my price target, tell you the truth. I think I said 175 last time. I was, I, I'm closer to 200 now because I, I think it's turning into an annuity business. And, you know, I downloaded iOS 9. It's, it's just incredible. Nobody's talking about it, but Android's in real trouble. You know, if you did a, if you just did a cursory review of the conference calls for uh, the latest conference for Google and Apple, uh, you know, Apple talks repeatedly throughout their conference call about Android switchers. Uh, the only mention of iOS on the Google conference call is to say they're now developing apps uh, that can search on um, are searchable on iOS. Uh, there's attrition from Android, and there's real conflict between the OEMs and the software. Uh, I think we're up at a point now where Samsung is showing me and Huawei can no longer advance the technology without owning the software, like 3D Touch, for example. They're not going to be able to recreate that because they don't control the software. So they're awkward bedfellows. Um, Apple has an enormous pricing power. Um, they've got an enormous install base for upgrade. I think they're going to sell 13 to 14 million iPhones. I think at least 13 million. They'll announce on Monday. If you look at uh, the CEO of T-Mobile, his comments recently about pre-orders being at 30%, I think that's a great proxy. But if you've got this, um, these payment plans, everyone's rushing from a two-year upgrade cycle to a one-year upgrade cycle, and these new financing plans, there's going to be more than expansion, and the iPhone's going to no longer have to be a, a wow product that you know has to beat 100 other competitors. It's going to turn into an annuity business, like the services business in the app store. Hmm. The app store and the are bigger than the iPad. So you've got an annuity business. It should be valued at a much, much higher multiple. Inter- I think if people put that out, it will be priced. Interesting take from Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He is the CIO of Lemelson Capital Management, covering a lot of different stocks, both bullish and bearish here. That's why I like talking to you. Thanks for coming on. We hope to have you on again soon. It's a blessing being with both of you. God bless you. Take care.